Welcome to this month's webinar presented by Synergy Settlement Services entitled The Art of Settlement, Regulatory Compliance When Settling Catastrophic Claims. My name is Jason Lazarus. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of Synergy. And today we're gonna to talk about a variety of issues that impact settlements. So the roadmap is starting out with ethical issues and malpractice concerns at settlement, talking about government benefits, uh, specifically disability planning for those that are eligible for needs-based benefits like Medicaid and SSI, then transitioning to Medicare secondary payer issues, and finishing up with some lien resolution tips related to ERISA, FIBA, and military liens, and ending with qualified settlement funds and some settlement consulting tips. As a starting point for our conversation today, I wanted to talk about ethical issues at settlement and the consequences of failing to advise a client at settlement about some of the important issues that they face. And as a starting point, there is a question of what is, what are the obligations to advise a client related to government assistance programs and preservation of those programs? What are the obligations to advise a client regarding financial settlement options? So as you'll see on this slide, there, there's, there are some laws that impact government benefit preservation that should be explained to a client. The first is 42 U.S.C. 1396 P.D. 4, which gives injury victims the ability to establish a special needs trust that keeps their needs-based government benefits in place regardless of the settlement amount. There are some cases, Grillo, French, and Saunders, where law firms have been sued for failing to advise a client about these preservation techniques. Then there's the Medicare Secondary Payer Act, which has implications for an injury victim in terms of future eligibility. That's the Medicare set-aside issue, which I'll talk about in detail. And then there's the financial issues, which are detailed in Section 104A2 of the Internal Revenue Code, which gives injury victims, the ability to accept a personal injury settlement income tax free and allows them to either do a lump sum or future periodic payments with a structured, structured settlement. And constructive receipt is an issue connected to 104A2 and the structured settlement option and triggering that can mean the loss of financial options for a client at settlement. The model rules I think if you read them uh, together, it makes it pretty clear that you've got to make sure the client gives informed consent at settlement, make sure that the client has adequate information and an explanation about the risks and alternatives uh, to a proposed course of conduct at settlement, and, and ultimately consulting with experts in other fields who may be able to add something to those discussions. Some commentators have uh, looked at these issues and agree with my position, which is that these issues have to be explained to a client, the option of structured settlements, trusts, and the effect of a settlement on a client's public benefits, and ultimately making sure that the client's best interests are served um, is something that the ABA's ethical guidelines for settlement negotiations supports as well. So given all the foregoing, what are the duties at settlement? In my opinion, the laws that impact settlement that I've just talked about have to be explained to the client because if there's silence uh, by legal counsel who's settling the case on behalf of the injury victim, the injury victim can't make an informed decision and there's a loss of an opportunity to exercise certain options available under the law and damages can flow from that. One of the cases I mentioned on the previous slide, Grillo, uh, a personal injury law firm and the guardian litem who recommended the settlement uh, were sued for legal malpractice for failing to set up a special needs trust and employing structured settlements. And basically the crux of that case were that the, the injury victim should have had all these issues explained to them. And really that boils down to making sure that you've got competent experts in all these complicated issues that can explain the matters to the client at settlement. And if you do not do that, uh, 
uh, who will, given that these are legal issues related to their personal injury settlement. And oftentimes I'm asked about, well, what's the threshold for addressing these issues at settlement? And it can be quite low if you're dealing with a client who's on SSI, if you give them $2,000 or more, you've just triggered a loss of their benefits. So it, it really is something that most settlements are going to need at least an analysis of what should be told to the clients at settlement. So with that, let's talk a little bit about the government benefits. This chart uh, is broken down by the government benefits type. So in the top half of the chart, these are needs-based and income and asset sensitive benefits, which are SSI, supplemental security income, and Medicaid. And Medicaid can be broken down into two different types. One is disability-based and the other is family-related non-disability. We'll focus mainly on the disability-based, uh, although sometimes it does come up where it's family-related. But what's important to keep in mind about SSI and Medicaid just overall is that these are cases where planning is needed and the Medicaid program will always have a lien, uh, whether it's a, a state Medicaid agency or Medicaid HMO. And then next in the chart are the entitlements, so SSDI and Medicare, these are not income or asset sensitive. Uh, SSDI is different from SSI. Oftentimes clients confuse these benefits and you really have to keep them distinct. And Medicare is where uh, if they are eligible, that's when the MSA issue arises and concern for compliance with the Medicare Secondary Payer Act. So planning for people, those that are disabled is important because you wanna make sure that ultimately the client understands how they can preserve those government benefits if they need that supplemental lifetime financial support and medical uh, care. But the disability planning process gives a client a team to protect their rights and have put into place a knowledgeable and long-term management team for that injury victim to make sure that their disabilities are addressed uh, in a way that honors them and make sure that they're protected long-term. So not every disabled client needs planning. It's only those that are uh, severely enough disabled that they meet the definition of disability for government benefit programs and receive either SSI and or Medicaid or both. Medicare or have both Medicaid and Medicare, those that are dual eligible. What's important when it comes to disability is making sure you remember this acronym, READ. So reviewing your client's benefits at intake and throughout the case to keep that updated to know what they're receiving, enlisting experts to educate you and your client about what issues might be presented by those benefits, making sure that you have copies of the award letter so you know definitively what the client receives in terms of benefits. As I said, oftentimes clients confuse SSI and SSDI, Medicaid and Medicare. And then ultimately documenting your file regarding your client's decision as to what to do and how you educated them about these issues. And it's especially important if they decide to forego their benefits. So with that, we'll talk now about Medicaid and SSI, which are the needs-based benefits and what the planning that is required for these benefits. So SSI is cash assistance for those 65 or older, blind or disabled. It has maximum payments, uh, and that's a shorthand way of determining whether your client is receiving SSI versus SSD. So if the SSI payment exceeds the max payments, then you know that your client is receiving SSDI versus SSI, but really you need the award letter to confirm. But unlike SSDI, there's no quarters having a worked requirement. So somebody that has never worked is gonna be receiving SSI if they're receiving social security benefits, typically speaking. And SSI has an asset cap of $2,000 for single individuals, $3,000 if married, and has an income cap. So it's asset cap and income cap. And that's important to keep in mind. Medicaid is just the basic healthcare coverage available for those that are in financial need. 
most states, $1 of SSI will trigger automatic Medicaid coverage. So when you have a client that is on Medicaid and or SSI is disabled, that's when you want to consider whether a special needs trust is appropriate or not. Because remember I said there's an income cap and an asset cap. So in the months that an injury victim gets a settlement, that would be income. If it's over the income cap, which is quite low, then that's going to be a problem in the month of receipt. If that money is still in their bank account the next month, that money is then an available resource, which would exceed the asset cap, which I said is $2,000 if you're single, $3,000 if you're married, so quite low. And typically speaking, the loss of SSI is acceptable because it's a small monthly payment. But as I said, in most states, $1 of SSI automatically gets you Medicaid coverage. And that creates the problem because the client not only loses their SSI, but loses their Medicaid coverage at the same time. So when settling cases for personal injury victims, there's really two primary types of trusts that are typically in, implemented. One is a standalone special needs trust that can be created for someone that's disabled under the age of 65, and then a pooled trust, which can be created for someone that's disabled, but of any age, so they can be over 65. So if you're over 65, the only option is a pooled special needs trust. Third-party special needs trusts are uh, utilized in situations where, say, you settle a case for a minor child and mom and dad have assets they ultimately want to leave to that minor child, they would set up a third-party special needs trust with their own assets or, say, a GoFundMe fundraiser was set up for the injury victim. That would go into a third-party trust. The D4A and D4C trusts are first-party trusts for the injury victim's own money. The third party is for other monies. The advantage or the primary advantage of setting up a special needs trust is it keeps the client eligible for their government assistance, but also gives them that framework uh, to manage their uh, future. And the trust can pay for pretty much everything but food or shelter. There are some significant disadvantages, no unrestricted use of the money. The sole benefit issue is that the trust can only be used for the injury victim's benefit, can't pay for other family members, and that sometimes becomes a problem. And at death, Medicaid must be paid back out of what's left over in the trust with the D4A and D4C first party trust. The only exception to that is third party trust. Quickly, before we move on, I wanted to make you aware of deeming. Deeming is when a husband and wife are married and one of them receives money, it's deemed to the other. Same thing between parent and minor child. So what that means is, for example, if you settle a medical malpractice case for a minor child who had a birth injury and all of the minor child's money is put into a special needs trust, but mom and dad have a consortium claim and you give mom and dad $100,000, $500,000 for their claim, you've just disqualified that minor child because mom and dad settlement is deemed to the minor child. So be aware and understand that issue as part of the planning that needs to be done in those scenarios. And oftentimes that means mom and dad giving up their consortium claim unless the minor can go without government assistance that's needs-based. And then exempt assets. So there are many instances where a trust is not done at settlement because the injury victim wants to buy a house or wants to buy a car or both. Those are both exempt assets and everything inside a house is exempt. So appliances, electronics, clothing, food inside the house. Those are all things that can be purchased with the settlement dollars that are not going to be countable. And so the money can be spent down on exempt assets. And after the month that money is spent down, then you requalify. Okay, so with that, we'll transition to talk a little bit about Medicaid liens. And when most trial lawyers think about Medicaid liens, uh, the Allborn case comes up. Uh, and the Allborn case examined the third party liability provisions which are required uh, in every state that accepts Medicaid dollars to make sure that when a third party is liable, the Medicaid agency recovers from the settlement uh, to the extent allowed by federal law. 
But there is a limitation on the state's uh, ability to recover under these third party liability acts uh, called the federal anti-lien statute. Uh, but it's, it's a narrow exception, um, the third party liability statutes to the anti-lien provisions, but there's this tension between those provisions. And in the Allborn case, the US Supreme Court was asked to look at those provisions and read them together to determine ultimately what a state Medicaid agency could recover at settlement uh, from a Medicaid beneficiary. And what the Allborn Court decided was that uh, ultimately a state could only assert a lien against and seek recovery from the portion of the settlement representing compensation for medical expenses. And ultimately, uh, the court stated that the third party liability provisions would be unenforceable insofar as they compelled a different conclusion. So you could only recover from the medical expenses portion. Now, following Allborn, there was a lot of litigation ongoing about, well, what what is medical expenses? And, and there were differing, uh, differing opinions by jurisdictions. So in 2013, uh, which was seven years after Auburn was decided, the US Supreme Court again looked at the issues surrounding Auburn and the underpinnings of what it, it had come up with in the Auburn decision, and basically affirmed Auburn and found that North Carolina statute, which required one third of any damages uh, recovered be paid to Medicaid did not comport with Allborn and was incompatible with the federal anti-lien provisions. And so uh, we all cheered and said, wow, you know, Allborn is a very solid um, opinion uh, that we don't have to worry about it being overturned. And that was the case until 2022 when Gallardo, which comes out of my home jurisdiction of Florida, went up to the US Supreme Court. And the issue that it went up under was whether the state Medicaid agency could recover from not only past medical expenses, which in our home jurisdiction had been the case, but also future medical expenses. So remember, Allborn just said, that the Medicaid agency was limited to recovery from medical expenses. Yeah, the reasonable and rational argument, in my opinion, was to be past medical expenses. Future medical expenses may or may not be paid by Medicaid. Why would Medicaid have any right to future medical expenses? So that's, you know, Gallardo argued that the anti lien provisions in the Medicaid Act prohibited Medicaid from attempting to recover its lien from anything other than amounts properly allocable to past medical expenses. And the federal government agreed with that position and argued on behalf of Gallardo and against Florida. Florida and other states argued on behalf of the state Medicaid agency. And unfortunately in June, uh, it came back as a seven to decision in favor of Florida. And Justice Thomas wrote the opinion uh, and found that Florida could seek reimbursement from settlement amounts representing payments for medical care, past or future. Uh, and that's because the assignment statute, which basically says that a Medicaid recipient assigns their uh, recovery uh, to the Medicaid agency to the extent of the Third Party Liability Act, that that is an exception to the anti-lien provision. Tortured end result, in my opinion. Uh, it does, it's important here to note that Medicaid third party liability statutes and laws vary state to state. So if the state statute says that it's limited to past medical expenses, then that's what it is. Florida happened to say it is past and future uh, and that issue is, went up to the Supreme Court. Now, if you ha happen to live in a jurisdiction where uh, the statute is similar to Florida or is silent and just says medical expenses, then you're going to have to look at ways of getting around the Gallardo decision. Uh, and there's some potential strategies that can be employed. One is disclaiming medical expenses as part of a settlement, amending the complaint to dismiss those claims pre-settlement, uh, 
but you may need to provide notice to the Medicaid agency. When you do that, you need to check your local law. Now, the pro rata methodology is what the Allborn uh, decision was based upon this, this formulaic way of looking at things, equitable distribution type uh, of argument, comparing total damages with what was actually recovered to come up with a ratio. Now, making those arguments going forward uh, under Allborn to reduce a lien, you're going to have to be more aggressive about the non-economic damages portion and don't undervalue it. You will need to bump up those dollars uh, to offset the inclusion of future medicals in the calculation. So you want to use high-end jury verdicts to have a high pain and suffering award. You could use a mock jury post-resolution to substantiate those damages. You want to downplay future medical expenses. So you want to make sure you remove from the life care plan any expenses that aren't medical. Uh, and also look at the pricing of the life care plan. How is it priced out? Was it priced out using uh, Medicaid uh, fee schedule or was it priced out using usual and customary? Also, if a client dual eligible in theory, you can argue that a Medicare set aside would be not includable as part of that. So there are, there are ways to do it. Uh, and two, if a person is gonna be on Medicaid in the future and is going to put dollars into an SNT, that's when there's a really good argument for using Medicaid rates to value the future medical expenses. So strategy becomes a lot more important these days post Gallardo to deal with the issues created by Gallardo, which in my humble opinion was decided incorrectly. With that, uh, we'll transition to talking to o for, uh, about Medicare and SSDI and the obligations related to that. So this is where the Medicare Secondary Payer Act comes in. But remember, SSDI and Medicare are not income or asset sensitive. They're entitlements. They're funded by the taxes we all pay uh, as employees into the system. And if somebody has enough um, quarters paid into the system, and has a qualifying disability, then they can receive SSDI. Medicare entitlement uh, comes 30 months after disability. And so you know, there's this connection between SSDI and Medicare. Uh, it's a six month elimination period when you start uh, your disability payments uh, or until you get your first disability payment and 24 months thereafter, you get Medicare eligibility. So when it comes to the Medicare Secondary Payer Act, it's, it's important to talk about the obligations. And, and under Medicare's um, interpretation of the act, it and by its own plain wording, it precludes Medicare from making payment to the extent that payment has been made or can reasonably be expected to be made due to workers' comp, liability, no fault, or insurance. And how Medicare views that those provisions is that there are two obligations, one from the date of the settlement going backward, conditional payments, that's what we'll talk about first, and then from the date of settlement forward, which is the Medicare set-aside issue. And Section 111 reporting kind of underlying all of this, which is uh, that now defendants have to report any settlement of $750 or greater, so almost every settlement has to be reported to Medicare, so Medicare is on notice of every conditional payment, which means law firms just have to be hyper vigilant about MSP compliance because the government has become very aggressive in uh, going after law firms, personal injury law firms for failing to reimburse Medicare. And these are a couple of examples of where that's occurred. Um, I'll talk a little bit about Myers Rod Bell because it's an important one just in terms of <clears throat> understanding what's important to focus on in terms of the amount that binds Medicare and how you bind Medicare. And then also this concept of that if you refer a case out, uh, which is um, really important, a really important concept, you cannot avoid Medicare secondary payer compliance by saying, 
the law firm you referred the case to should have taken care of that. That's not a way around these issues. So ultimately, law firms really need a MSP compliance program within their law firm to make sure that the government is reimbursed because the alternative to that is winding up in the position with the DOJ breathing down your neck, which you don't want to do. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the step-by-step -step process to make sure that you understand what the responsibilities are from the plaintiff's perspective when a uh, Medicare beneficiary is being represented by your firm. The first step is to report the case to BCRC. Uh, when you report, you need a proof of representation and a consent, uh, and that being sent to the BCRC triggers them to issue a rights and responsibilities letter. From that point on, when you are corresponding with the Medicare, you want to use their cover sheet, which is on the Medicare website. So after uh, the rights and responsibilities letter, uh, the BCRC will identify an interim recovery amount and will issue a conditional payment letter that's typically within 65 days of the rights and responsibilities letter. If you're not getting responses within these timeframes, it probably means something's gone awry. Maybe you didn't use the correspondence cover sheet. Maybe you didn't send in your proof of rep or consent at the start. Uh, anyway, if those, if those dates are not being adhered to, there's probably something wrong and a good practice is to follow up. So once the interim recovery amount uh, is identified with the conditional payment letter, that's when you wanna go through that and dispute any unrelated charges. Now, if the amount is very low uh, and you know that it should be higher, what you can expect is that when you do finally settle the case and send in your settlement notice, number five, uh, which is the final settlement detail that you send to Medicare when you settle, the BCRC could issue a final demand that greatly exceeds the conditional payment letter. And it's important to note that the final demand is the only number that binds Medicare. Anything you receive through the portal or from a written CPL does not bind Medicare. And once Medicare issues the final demand, interest starts to accrue from the date the final demand was issued but is only assessed if the debt is not paid within 60 days. But there is no tolling of that interest if you request an appeal, compromise, or waiver if you don't pay the final demand and ultimately gets referred over to Treasury for collection after 90 days. I did, before we talk about proper methods of re resolving conditional payments, want to outline some mistakes and the biggest mistake you can make is reliance upon the conditional payment letter. I was trying to make this point earlier. Remember when I talked about the DOJ actions, I mentioned this Myers, Rod Bell matter. Well, what happened in this case is that uh, the law firm went through all the right processes, let Medicare know about the Medi Med Mal case, uh, Medicare indicated in the CPL that the amount owed was 14,990. The mistake that was made was that ultimately the law firm thought they could rely upon that 14,990 figure, uh, which I, I think was supported by the number that was showing up in the portal, if I remember correctly. In any event, the case ultimately settled and Medicare got the final settlement detail and a final demand was issued in the amount of $330,000, which obviously was a, a huge difference between what the CPL indicated and what the final demand actually indicated. The law firm tried to appeal the amount due, which was ultimately denied, and it wound up going over to the Department of Justice, and uh, ultimately the law firm turned it over to their e &O carrier. So you never, ever want to rely upon something in the portal or a CPL. The only thing that binds Medicare is that final demand. And then USV Kerrigan is, is a good example of not understanding the proper process or just the consequences of ignoring the process. So this case involved a car accident for a Medicare beneficiary. Medicare was put on notice. They ultimately issue a final demand and uh, the 
lawyer handling the matter had went to a Texas state court and got an order reducing the Medicare conditional payment down. Uh, and ultimately, the government then filed suit against the lawyer for ignoring the process. And first and foremost, the, the government's argument was the Texas court lacked jurisdiction to adjudicate Medicare's recovery rights, spot on. Uh, sovereign immunity applies and the Texas court didn't have subject matter jurisdiction. Even if they did, there are administrative remedies. There's an appeals process, which I'm gonna talk about in a moment, that you have to exhaust before a federal district court would have the exclusive subject matter jurisdiction to hear that. And then ultimately the attorney uh, would have ultimate liability and personal liability for failing to reimburse Medicare. And that's exactly why the government was pursuing the attorney directly. So the key takeaway is you've got to make sure you use the proper channels for challenging conditional payments. So let's talk about what you need to know about resolution. So there's really three options. Uh, one, pay the amount that Medicare says is owed under the final demand. So after you've done an audit and verification of the amount owed and make sure you remove unrelated care and then use the, the standard reduction calculations found in the Code of Federal Regulations. Next is appeal. Uh, which is lengthy and interest will continue to accrue. The third is to pay the final demand and seek a compromise or, or complete waiver of the amount. And if you're successful, Medicare will actually issue a refund of the final demand that was paid, either in full or partial. So as I said, the Code of Federal Regulations gives you the different reduction formulas. So it's, it's basically a procurement cost reduction standard uh, standardized uh, resolution. The problem arises when the amount that was recovered is less than what's owed to Medicare. And in that amount, that situation, basically the client will get nothing and you will get your fees and costs, which is typically not a good solution. That typically leads to appeals, but appeals are lengthy. 420 days of internal appeals with Medicare contractors before you get to the fifth level, which is judicial review by a federal district court. Unappealing, because as I said, interest will continue to accrue all that while if you've not paid the final demand. So the third option, which I said is desirable, is seeking a compromise or waiver from either BCRC or CMS directly. And there's three different statutory authorities under which uh, Medicare can compromise or waive its claims. Uh, one is based on financial hardship, one is best interest of the program, and one is compromise. Really, these are arguments uh, that either it would cause a financial hardship to have the client pay the amount owed or making equitable arguments about how the client wasn't made whole. That's what this process is for. And if successful, as I said, Medicare issues a refund because when you go down this path, we recommend paying the final demand so the interest meter stops running. This is a very successful uh, method of reducing conditional payments. Uh, our lien resolution team has a success rate over 76% last year in 2021, uh, almost $1.6 million in refunds secured for Medicare beneficiaries. The average refund last year was in excess of $21,000. And then ultimately, since we started helping injury victims secure these refunds, we've uh, secured over $10.9 million in refunds. So. If you're not doing this yourself for your clients, you should be outsourcing this to an expert who can get these kinds of results for your client. So we've talking about conditional payments. I wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about Medicare Advantage plans, also known as Medicare Advantage Organization, MAO, or Part C plans. I call these the hidden lien uh, because 
when you contact Medicare to do the process I just went through for conditional payments, they will not tell you whether there is a Medicare Advantage plan lien because Medicare Advantage plans are different from Medicare itself. They are run by private insurance companies who use Medicare dollars. And when you contact Medicare, they don't have the information to provide to you. Uh, now that's changing somewhat with some new law, which we don't have time to get into the detail today, but in any event, you're not going to be told about these. And if you're not aware of one of these liens, uh, it could be very costly because these plans have the same recovery rights as Medicare, but what they've done is they've used the private cause of action for double damages as a weapon against all the parties involved when Medi Medicare Advantage plans aren't reimbursed. So um, in my home jurisdiction in the 11th Circuit, we've got the Western Heritage case where Humana sued the insurance plan for failing to reimburse. And the court said that, yes, they are entitled to double the amount of the lien for failing to reimburse. And the Third Circuit agrees with that. We do have some split in the circuits with the ninth and sixth disagreeing with the 11th and third. So you need to look at your law, but just be aware that these Medicare Advantage plans have become very aggressive about their recovery rights. And they've gone after personal injury law firms directly. Um, and the, the law supports that, uh, as you'll see on this slide. The Humana versus Paris Blank uh, matter at the bottom of this slide uh, is a case where an MAO went directly after a personal injury law firm for double the $191,000 lien amount. Uh, this was a matter where we assisted that law firm to address these issues, but you'd never want to be in a position where you're having to argue about owing directly from your law firm double a lien amount that was not identified. And what's important to note is that you, you have a group like MSP Recovery, which is a group that is scraping accident reports to see if they can find instances where an MAO was not reimbursed because they're taking on assignments from these MAOs to pursue recovery on their behalf. And they are very aggressive about doing this and are litigating these issues successfully. So what do you do to avoid this type of exposure for your law firm? Ultimately, you really have to either have your staff or yourself being a detective and going through a specific process to identify these types of instances where there's a potential exposure, making sure you've got copies of all the insurance cards for a Medicare beneficiary and talking to your client about whether they are on part A and part B or have transitioned over to Part C because they can elect into Part C if they're a Medicare beneficiary at any point during the open enrollment periods. Um, so developing that process internally and training staff to find these unidentified liens is important because when you do find them, they are typically liens that can be reduced. Our lien resolution group averages almost 60% reductions on MAO plan liens. So it's possible to reduce these, but you have to make sure you identify them and ultimately engage in the resolution process with the MAO plan. So with that, let's, let's now talk a little bit about total MSP compliance, which then means we talk about the issues from the date of the settlement forward, which is an issue everybody typically cringes when I talk about, which is Medicare set-asides because of the amount of misinformation out there about this issue. Uh, and it's become a bigger issue because of Section 111 reporting, which gives Medicare insight into every settlement, including injury diagnosis codes, which can trigger a denial of care based on Medicare identifying what is related to the personal injury settlement or not in terms of future care. So let's talk a little bit about Medicare set-asides uh, and why this is important. So because of the mandatory insurer reporting, 
And because of those ICD codes being uh, reported to Medicare, it could trigger a denial of care. And if Medicare denies injury-related care, you would have to go through that internal appeals process, so 420 days before you could ever argue in a federal district court why the denial of care was wrong. So think about that risk in terms of your client. If you have a catastrophically injured client and they experience a denial of care and you didn't explain to them about the Medicare Secondary Payer Act and how potentially they could lose their benefits uh, and coverage for future injury-related care, that's an exposure and an issue that you don't want to have as a law firm. So Medicare has attempted to regulate in this area by issuing uh, these notifications of their intention to regulate. This was the most recent attempt. The last one was in 2012. This was just recently withdrawn again, which puts everybody in this untenable position of having no regulation or statute we can point to that says we need to do a Medicare set aside. Yet, it really, in my opinion, is no different than advising a Medicaid or SSI recipient about their ability under federal law to create a special needs trust. For Medicare beneficiaries, it's no different. Explaining to them about the MSP, about mandatory insurer reporting, that if you don't want to have any risk at all, here's a mechanism that you can employ that Medicare has said is the preferred method to protect the trust fund. It is important to understand this is a gray area, but you only have to worry about it if you're representing a current Medicare beneficiary, so someone that's disabled, 65 or older, has end-stage renal disease, ALS, or a disabled adult child or arguably those with a reasonable expectation of becoming a Medicare beneficiary within 30 months, that's those that are on SSDI. That reasonable expectation category though, they have a much less likelihood of experiencing denial because they are not going to have their settlements reported to Medicare, only a current Medicare beneficiary does. It's also important to remember that just because a client needs to be advised about the Medicare Secondary Payer Act doesn't mean that they have to do an MSA. So there are ways of making sure that ultimately there's no shifting of the burden, which is the point of a Medicare set aside so that when you settle a case, if you're receiving dollars for future medical, you're not supposed to shift the burden to Medicare for those future medical treatments. So one way is electing to a Medicare Advantage plan, MAOs, while they enjoy the same um, rights as Medicare itself, that's based on statute. Since Medicare set-asides have no regulations or statute, it would be very hard for an MAO plan to argue that a injury victim should establish an MSA. You could elect into private insurance coverage for your injury victim client, or they could. Uh, you, the injury victim can become self-pay. They could set up a trust for future medical expenses, they could set up a structured settlement. So a lot of different options. But if a client is Medicare eligible, is going to need to treat in the future, and is receiving settlement dollars for future medical, that's when you want to consider advising the client and they should consider an MSA or some type of an alternative. And what it boils down to is you need a process within your law firm to identify cases with Medicare beneficiaries. And if they are Medicare eligible, when they sell their case, determine if future medicals are funded by that settlement. And if they are, educate that client about the risk of failing to do anything. If they don't set aside what, what potentially happens. And then let the client select an appropriate solution. And this acronym CAD, consulting experts, advising the client about the MSC, MSP, and then documenting your file, critical. Uh, it, just like I talked about when it came to the needs-based government benefits, these are absolutely no different. With that, we're going to focus on a couple of different lien types and then finish up talking a little bit about some settlement consulting issues. So this is, this is always the um, 
hot topic when we talk about liens, ERISA. And how do you reduce, despite the McCutcheon case, which was a U.S. Supreme Court case, which uh, certainly made ERISA plans uh, more emboldened and did admittedly make their recovery rights stronger based on some of the holdings in that case. But it's really important when you're talking about ERISA at the outset is to know, are you really dealing with an ERISA plan? Because ERISA only governs employer employee plans. It will not govern a federal government employee. That's a FIBA uh, lien is what you would have there. If the employer is a state government, it's going to be governed by state law. If the employer is a church, state law will apply also. But if the question is answered yes, that it truly is an ERISA plan, the next question that you have to ask and know the answer to is, is it self-funded or is it fully insured? So self-funded plans are those that are funded by contributions from an employer and employee. And one of the ways to know whether it is self-funded is if the plan is named an employer group or titled as an ASO, it's likely self-funded. Or is it fully insured, which is funded by the purchase of insurance coverage? Now, the difference is, is that if it's self-funded, ERISA completely preempts state law and you're dealing with the McCutcheon case. And that makes it more difficult. If it is fully insured, then it's subject to state law. And really the best way to know for sure is by reviewing the plan language. So the summary plan document, the master plan document, looking at the form 5500, which doesn't always give you the right answer, asking the plan administrator or recovery agent. So this question is very important to know the answer to. And if it is ERISA and if it's self-funded, you want to avail yourself of 1020B4. And 1024B4 requires disclosure by ERISA plans of things that they don't necessarily want to share. Summary plan document, latest annual report, terminal report, bargaining agreement, trust agreement, contract, or other instruments under which the plan is established and operated. Those documents are documents that you need to have to make sure that ultimately you are analyzing the strength of that ERISA plan's recovery rights. But when you make this request, you have to make it to the plan administrator. You cannot send the request to a recovery vendor like Rawlings, Conduit, Optum. They are not the plan administrator. So directly to the plan. Now, the reason why that's important is because you have to send it there to trigger penalties for non-compliance. And there's a whole list of cases here on the presentation that show that penalties do get uh, assessed for failures to provide all these documents under 1020 before. And the reason that becomes important is because those penalties can give you leverage in negotiating lien if they fail to provide the documents and those penalties keep accruing, that, that could exceed the amount of the lien. But more importantly, it's important to get everything requested under 1024 before is so that you can check that the plan, for example, reaches first party coverage if you're dealing with that issue. Because oftentimes we see language is silent or vague. Does language overcome made whole? For example, in my home circuit of the 11, specific plan language is required to overcome made whole. Does the language overcome common fund? Because if the language is silent, then a reduction of attorney fees may be appropriate. And that was identified in the McCutcheon case that the plan has to draft its contract to say that specifically. So some really important reasons why that 1024 before request is imperative. Now, let's, let's focus a little bit on FIBA uh, and then military lien. So FIBA winds up being a lot like ERISA plans. Under the Neville's case, uh, FIBA completely pre preempts state law, um, and the FIBA liens have, FIBA, FIBA lien holders have very powerful recovery rights, so the government has that on behalf of government employees. But 
the way to counteract that is, is looking at the plan language and reviewing the documents for weaknesses in recovery language to make arguments as to why the FEBA plan is not entitled to their full amount to be reimbursed. When it comes to military liens, at the outset, it's important to know these take a lot of time to resolve. Unfortunately, very slow. Uh, there's three different types of coverage, VA, CHAMP VA, and TRICARE. The Federal Medical Care Recovery Act, MICRA, is what governs uh, the recovery rights um, and gives the military uh, plans the ability to recover when third-party liability is at issue. Uh, it really is important early on to identify these coverages and reach out to the correct arm of government to make sure that you start the process of obtaining billing and uh, negotiating the lien amount. What hinders this oftentimes is the government uh, through the military will seek protection agreements that have you agreeing to know fees or costs on the government's portion of recovery. We don't recommend that you sign that. Uh, and also the issue of whether first party benefits can be recovered, uh, that's the Anajar case. So make sure you take a look at that if you've got first party recovery. So when it comes to the last lien type, we're going to talk a little bit about hospital and provider liens. What is incredibly important is that this just varies uh, from state to state by uh, statute and ordinance. Uh, but you, you really have to know whether a hospital has a lien or whether it's simply a debt, that lien versus debt dichotomy. And if you want to learn more about that, we have a whole presentation on that. But basically, at, at the end of the day, if they do have a lien, uh, most state laws require that amount to be reasonable. And the criteria for reasonable is often set by comparing the charges to what a patient with Medicare, TRICARE, or Blue Cross, or other insurance receives. The problem is, is that typically when you're negotiating these liens, you don't have that information. So that's one of the, the things that you have to determine. And that's something that Synergy does for lawyers is give them access to that information about uh, reasonableness. And uh, so you've got to make sure ultimately that you are negotiating from a place of strength. And ultimately that comes from having the amount of uh, dollars that is reasonable ultimately for that uh, hospital to have charged. And when you're negotiating it, the best practice is to take the actual cost of care, that reasonableness amount, plus a reasonable profit in resolving that lien. So last couple of slides um, before we finish up today. When you settle a case that's complex and needs the type of planning that um, I've been talking about today, which could be resolution of liens, which we just went through, or it could be Medicare set-asides or special needs trusts, whatever it might be. Uh, there is a trust that can be created pursuant to treasury regulations, and it acts as a holding tank for a cash settlement. It can be used in mass torts uh, or single plaintiff cases. These have been used for years and years in mass tort cases. The reason that these are used is it, it creates some time to do all of the work that goes into the complex planning for catastrophically injured clients, but doesn't have them losing their ability to, to exercise some of these options, which I started out the presentation talking about, making sure that they don't lose options available to them under the law, setting up a structured settlement, setting up a special needs trust, setting up an MSA, because uh, you can do all of that out of the QSF. And it avoids triggering constructive receipt. The only drawback is that it does require court approval and does involve some additional expense. The types of cases that typically you would want to implement a QSF in could be all of these, or if you have allocation issues between injury victims, if you've got multiple layers of coverage where you want to aggregate settlement dollars, if there are complex, difficult lien resolution issues, government public benefit planning issues, 
structured settlements for the client or for uh, attorney's fees are contemplated, all the above. Those are those are some perfect scenarios where you may want to implement the QSF. So lastly, I wanted to talk a little bit about settlement consulting and planning and the financial options, which I mentioned at the start of the presentation. So when a personal injury case settles, a client has really four different options. Take the money in a lump sum, take it in the form of a structured settlement, take it in the form of a trust, or a combination of all those different options. And my advice is that you ultimately need for your client to have access to experts who can create a customized tailored plan that addresses future needs as well as the required government benefits. And doing the analysis of whether they should be continuing to stay with Medicaid if they're Medicaid eligible versus private and Medicare versus private is critical to understanding what should be done ultimately that will work best for that client. Making sure that you have an understanding of really what the real world cost of funding future needs are. So if you've got a life care plan doing a cost funding analysis, analysis of the value of public benefits that would be covered in terms of the life care plan items, because knowing what you're giving up if you do give that up is important. And ultimately having a team of experts that can give product agnostic agnostic recommendations for how to protect that client. I always like to end my presentations with uh, a slide uh, that shows our team because we have a mission-driven team that cares deeply about serving injury victims and protecting lives and improving lives. We actually track the amount of lives that we positively impact and families that we help every year. And the whole team celebrates that. So we've got this deep team of experts that believes deeply in what we do and cares immensely about those we serve, which is what's made us one of the fastest growing companies in America. Uh, that team, I'm incredibly proud of them. And putting that team to work on behalf of your clients is going to make sure that your client is ultimately protected and that you can focus on what you do best. We handle from the start of the case, the healthcare lien resolution, MSB compliance, government benefit preservation, settlement consulting, and attorney fee deferral, as well as group projects where, you know, smaller settlements uh, that are mass tort driven uh, are, are areas where we can deploy all these services in a holistic manner to help your clients. If you have any questions about today's presentation, uh, feel free to reach out to me via email or call me. Uh, this is what I do on a day in day out basis is work with personal injury law firms all across the country as a synergy to help with these difficult issues. If you wanna learn more about Synergy, visit us on the web or contact us toll free. And thank you for tuning in to Synergy's webinar this month. 